Pure manic. You have probably done it before. Thank you for the good advice. Okay, contestable markets. Entry is free, no incumbent cost advantages. And entry is absolute. What which means that if there will be an incumbent that will act as a natural monopoly, if a newcomer will enter, will underbid the incumbent modely, the newcomer will capture the entire market and displace the incumbent completely. That is what's meant by entry is absolute. If you enter underbid the incumbent just marginally, and the only reason for you to underbid him huh, is that the price level will be as high as just to give a positive profit. If the price will be higher than price price equal to long run average cost, just mm, a little bit higher, giving the incumbent just <coughs> some profit, the newcomer will enter, underbid him her monthly, giving him her, the incumbent, no chance for any actions that will be counteractions <coughs> and the newcomer will capture the entire market and the third assumption is that here there is no such thing as sunk cost you can have fixed cost but no sunk cost if you enter and if you are a hit and run company, you just enter, underbid the incumbent marginally, and then you can withdraw again with no sunk cost that you will have to cover. That means that all the fixed cost can easily be transferred into a second hand market where you will have the entire investment back from the second hand market. Therefore, the hit and run players are important. And here you can easily see that there is a need for having complete information so it's easy to capture enough, informa enough information to, uh, to play this game. Let's now see the market equilibrium from figure 5.4. Here you have, as you are familiar with, the demand curve, and in linear one. You have the module revenue curve, twice as deep. You have the long run average cost curve, telling you that here you have economies of scale because it's falling in the whole range. And we have long run margin cost curve that is U shaped and will increase when we pass QM. So, if this player, the incumbent, will act as a natural monopolist, what will be the price level? That will be P 
Tm y cum equals that's where the marginal revenue curve will intersect with the long run marginal cost curve. In Qm, you have market equilibrium, the price level Pm, and the player will act as a proper monopolist. Why cannot this solution exist? Because a newcomer will know that by just underbidding the incumbent marginally, just PM minus delta, the uh, newcomer will enter, will capture the entire market that will be QM plus delta. So the incumbent will be displaced and the newcomer will take over and if the price level will be just marginally higher than PC why PC? because at PC the price will be exactly equal to long run average cost where producing QC units that will be the competitive solution the incumbent will have no profit just the price level just enough to cover the long run average cost and why come is this the equilibrium because if a newcomer wants to enter this market then by underbidding the incumbent marginally PC minus delta the newcomer will lose money and there will be no incentives for any players to enter <coughs> a market where the player will know that he or she will lose money so the price level because of this kind of contestable market where the potential competition is so strong there are so many players out there wanting to enter this market and the incumbent will be forced to just end up with prices equal to the perfect competitive solution. Mm -hmm. I remember this discussion at this institution in 1982 when this article came I was here <laughs> teaching economics transport economics in 1982 I was young <laughs> with no grey hair and, uh, and I remember a colleague of mine that also was a politician that was very eager to use this model in the Norwegian political system and because of this article because of the trend early in the 80s because of my colleague being a conservative he argued for contestable markets and the potential competition being strong enough for a perfect competitive system to exist even though you have a natural monopoly and it was a very very interesting period 
concerning transportation economics because of this article and because of this, let's call it for a kind of conflict be between the conservatives believing in a marketplace with no regulations and in Norway the, r the more regulated system and by then the transportation sector was heavily regulated. And in the long run I can easily see that what my colleague started he was a professor before me and he died very young he was only 50 years old when he died and uh, I can easily conclude that in the Norwegian system in the long run he was right more and more of the solution within the transport sector has been deregulated within the belief that a deregulated market to some extent will be able to find the solution that will be close to this perfect competitive solution. And that is not to conclude that all the assumption within the contestable market model has been fulfilled. But there are reasons to say that even though the assumption is not perfectly fulfilled, to some degree, the assumption is good enough to end up in a solution that might be not very far from the perfect competitive solution and telling us that the extra transaction costs to regulate the market can be so high that it's even more costly to regulate than to take the dead weight loss by giving the market forces a solution that is not the perfect competitive solution but quite close to. So if the dead weight loss will be not very high compared to the regulating cost or the transaction cost by regulations, then my colleague was right when he in 1988 started to experiment politically with this new contestable market model within the Norwegian transport sector. And we can easily see when we now go back to No. No. We can easily see that in 1982 the Norwegian airline industry was heavily regulated. And what Ronald Reagan did in the US was that he deregulated the airline industry completely, believing that the contestable market model was good enough. So through deregulation, just tried out the contestable market model. When did that happen in Norway? The deregulation took place more or less in 1998 much later, with much more experience for what happened in other countries. And we uh, had by then more than one airline company 
because you might need more than one to deregulate and you need if you have only one you need to have many foreign players that can easily enter the Norwegian market so that if the price is here when you travel with with the plane if the prices will be higher than at the minimum perfect competitive market system then if there will be foreign airline companies that easily can enter that can displace the incumbent completely then that might be enough for the Norwegian players even though there will be only one to just keep the prices to the perfect competitive solution yeah how many uh, Norwegian airlines operate in Norway? we have two main players that will be SAS and Norwegian but they have competition from foreign companies that can just go from Oslo to other airports in other country so Oslo, Gardermoen, Bergen and Trondheim, Stavanger will have quite many companies that will compete with those two Norwegian companies on foreign destinations but in between Norwegian cities you will, you will have only these two companies and we have some small like Vidra and some even smaller and they just compete with SAS and Norwegian on some uh, relations but they have most of all these small airports and, and that is where we have competitive tendering where we subsidize them and where Vidra and some other foreign companies will compete for the contracts there will be one winner in that competitive tendering process and that winner will in a way have a natural monopoly market but when they win a contract the prices will be regulated in the contract so when we have that competitive tendering process going on in Norway all companies will try to capture contracts and so far I analyzed this market as early as in 1998 to gather experience and Vidra had almost all the contracts and still now 16 years later Vidra still has almost all the contracts and I just look at their profit and I can easily see that something must be wrong because Vidra always earns a rather high profit and if this competitive tendering model contestable markets model if that model would have been the model in this market in real life we should observe no such thing as a positive profit let's go to the figure if the price would be higher 
like long run average cost, what would have been the solution? Just somewhat higher through a competitive tendering game. A competitor would probably modestly underbid, win the contract, and capture a profit somewhat lower than either. So why come? Because we have not completely fulfilled all the assumptions. We have definitely some cost. We have definitely some cost advantages for the incumbent. And because of that, we never end up in PC. But we don't end up in PM either. <laughs> we end up somewhere in between. So that's a good model, somewhere in between. And the closer we are to PC, the more satisfied the consumers will be. And the closer we are to PM, the happier Vidra will be. And since we are somewhere in between, probably we are closer to PC than to PM, but not all the way down to PC. So competitive tendering was the game that my colleague in 1982 started to try to introduce in the Norwegian system. He didn't succeed doing that in 1982, but what he tried to do has actually been what has happened much later. Now we have competitive tendering within the ferry sector, within the airline industry, within the bus sector, within the, uh, the coastal line, uh, and the experience so far is to some extent mixed. But the alternative with the regulations we had in 1982 is no good alternative. So I'm going to lecture over this topic very soon at the seminar here in Malta, where we will go through the ferry sector with the experience. Is it a good solution for the ferry companies and for the users of the ferries that we have a system now with competitive tendering? Because we really have that. And the contracts will last for in between six and ten years. If there will be a very costly many new ferries in the relationship, they have to invest so much that the contract will last for ten years. And here's where you will have some cost when you invest in a new ferry. an asset-specific ferry that fits well to the Norwegian ferry system. Do you think that he will have all the fixed cost back in the second-hand market if these ferries were sold to Greece shipping companies? Not at all. Not at all. So there will exist, exist no second-hand market where you can say that you have no sunk cost. So the ferry sector is definitely a sector with high fixed, with high sunk cost. And what about this um, going to the assumptions? Go back. In 
the ferry company, the ferry sector, can you believe that there will be no incumbent cost efficiency compared to new commerce? Let's just go through that assumptions, that assumption in relation to ferries. If we have an incumbent that has just won a 10 years contract, they have invested heavily in new ferries. And in a learning by doing process that will last for 10 years, where you have an asset specific ferry, that just uh, is fit is fits into the Norwegian ferry system for a newcomer to enter when they just will arrange that uh, competitive tendering process 10 years later do you think it's easy for a newcomer to win that contract no, because the newcomer will have to invest heavily in new ferries with high sunk cost, and the newcomer will have a cost disadvantage because the incumbent have learned through that 10 years period in a learning by doing process. So it's not really easy to enter. But no and then it happens that the incumbent is so self-confident that when they bid for a contract, they can go too far trying to capture a high profit. And all of a sudden, a newcomer just underbid in a sealed competitive tendering process, underbid marginally, and win the contract. And then you will have a change. The newcomer will have that contract for 10 years. And if the old one will return back 10 years later, <laughs> that can easily be a very competitive market that can be close to contestable market. So in the long run, if we will have enough companies that really are cost efficient with long experience, and if there are companies enough to compete, then contestable markets might be not that far off. But the experience is that in this market, the incentives to merge is very strong. Why come? Because if they merge instead of four, when I started doing my analysis within the sixth sector, I seem to remember that there were more than 20 ferry companies along the coastline. Can you guess how many we have left? Six. Four. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and they still try to merge. Quite aggressive. Try to merge. Because to move from four down to three, down to two, and down to one, if there will be only two, that we learn over time in a learning by doing process, they can easily communicate, play a kind of signal game. If you will have a high bid on this contract, you will have that one. But then you have a low bid on the other contract, and they can try to signal to each other because according to the antitrust law, they are not allowed to talk to each other. They are not allowed to contract. You will be put 
in prison if you contract a price in a, in a competitive tendering process and if you communicate prices between players those communicating prices if it can be proved that they have done so they will be put directly into jail so that is where we have to some extent contestable markets but in the long run the driving force can be so strong to merge that we really end up with market power and through market power the players will gain a profit and the losers will be the consumers we will have a dead weight loss because of market power. And still, the airline industry will easily conclude that the competition in that sector will be quite hard. They, in the long run, don't earn too much money. We have players that will be the low cost companies that will try to underbid all the other players like SAS. Norwegian is a low cost company trying to underbid SAS and SAS will definitely have to reduce their cost level and they try to play with prices in under a very competitive system. So the airline industry has developed through deregulation and all the transport sectors will have competitive tendering competition and the development has been that definitely there have been incentives for those companies that want to survive to be very cost efficient survival of the fittest and quite many companies have gone bankruptcy within the airline industry and many new newcomers have come up putting pressure on the market prices and in the textbook they state that one sector where we probably will see contestable markets is where we like Norway have a very small marketplace because Norway is a very very small country and since the Norwegian economy is very open except for what we do within the food industry <laughs> farming industry the rest of our economy is on the potential competition from trade on domestic market. So if we will have a Norwegian only one airline industry, airline company, going between all the Norwegian cities, in the long run because of competition from international trade companies outside Norway we will probably have potential competition on our domestic market through foreign companies 
So for a small country with a very open economy, we take the advantage of the very competitive international system. And since the industrial sector here are not protected, they just will have to behave as if they were on the perfect competitive system, putting their prices no equal to modern cost and develop a very efficient competitive system. Mm. That's model number two contestable model. Shall we move to the last model? Network economies. This is where we definitely have many of what we will call this new industrial sector, computers, iPhone, iPad, these computer games, And once we talk about network economies, we easily end up in four different perspectives, telling us that there will be a tendency for all those industrial sectors that will be typically network economies to end up close to monopoly sector. But since these markets are so turbulent because they play over innovation and R&D, Microsoft can be a winner for a while, IBM can be a winner for a while, but as we have seen in the long run, because of investing in new technology, so many newcomers will come up with smart ideas that will change the marketplace completely. And all of a sudden, they will take over IBM and Microsoft will, to some extent, displaced and we will have change in the marketplace because of network economy. Let's now see what's meant with this one, two, three, four main assumptions or main driving forces. The first one it's what we call complementarity. What's meant with complementarity? That is, you don't only buy a computer, you also buy everything that you need to operate that computer. And you buy more or less a package and since you don't only have the physical computer, but you have everything else needed to operate it, these products will be complementary, complementary to each other. And if you buy one big piece, you have to buy the other one. And since you buy a system, You um, just end up giving the producer.
uses of a computer an incentive to also produce the rest of the system that you need and then complementarity means that the producer can capture more of the market by producing all the parts needed in a system and it might be more difficult for a newcomer to enter since the newcomer doesn't only need to enter the computer market but they will need to enter also the total system. Let's take the rest of this discussion at 